Hi, morning. Uh, welcome to the Gorjuri Karate Center. Uh, there's a lot of barking in the background. It's that time of the day where the dogs get let out, so please bear with us. Um, this morning, Nogi, I am in my shorts and my t-shirt, and I'm making the video because I've just had a very, very long conversation, per se, with uh, another karate guy who is in another part of South Africa who is really struggling and he's going through um, really hard times. He's basically on the bones of his ass uh, financially. He's had no work and uh, there's problems within how he is being used within the dojo and my advice to him is it's time to start your own dojo. So this video may be a little bit controversial and it might hit a few nerve centers for a few instructors and it might hit a few nerve centers for a couple of people out there and it might even offend a few people. Um, I think we've got to look at the big picture overall. And if there are points that I make up that you don't agree with, that's okay. Um, there is logic and a method behind every point that I hopefully will make. So, um, when are you allowed to open and become a sensei and open a dojo and when can you start with this? Because a lot of people are like, well, I've got my black belt, I'm going to become a sensei. So, rule number one, go back into your organization, see what the minimum requirements are for you to be a dojo instructor, a dojo owner, and a sensei. Many organizations have got some kind of structural base where they say there is a minimum grade, a certain amount of time that you have to have been operating in that capacity uh, or in that grade before you qualify to be um, an, an instructor. So um, I would say a general rule of thumb would be the instructor's grade for people to run and have their own dojos, around about third dan, and you must have had some kind of teaching experience along the way. So from shodan, nidan, and possibly into the beginning of your sundan, you may be helping out and assisting the dojo. And this is part of that learning process. This is type uh, a type of apprenticeship, per se where you are learning. When you think about it, for a lot of schools, shodan to sundan is approximately three to four years, which is a respectable amount of time for an apprenticeship. The moment the instructor is drawing this out and making this while well, you're a third dan and I need you to work for another five years, then there's something not right with this equation. Because in the workplace, if you do an apprenticeship of three to five years maximum, you are then qualified to work on your own. So, when instructors are doing more than this, uh, there is one word for this. This is called exploitation. Okay, and many instructors out there globally, you exploit your students. I'm sorry. Your students, when they watch this and they come and say, why are you exploiting me? You can send me some nasty messages on Facebook or whatever. The simple reality is, this is not cool. And it's actually counterproductive to growing good, successful dojos. You have to have a very good reason why you do not want somebody to be an instructor. They might not have the right personality, they might not have the right psychological predisposition to being an instructor. And then it comes down to the fact is, why are they a black belt if they're not good people? Because they should be good people first. Okay, the next thing we want to look at is, where do you set up your dojo? So, it is usually not a good idea to leave a dojo where you have been an assistant instructor and set up a dojo within a very close proximity to the dojo that you've been in. It is a little bit of a bitter pill for the instructor that you have left as a um, as you become immediately competition. So there's usually a guideline and in some schools and some styles the guideline is in certain areas five kilometers, in other areas ten kilometers. In some places it's as much as twenty kilometers. In Okinawa, it might only be 300 meters because if you throw a stone in any direction, it will more than likely land on a dojo's roof in Okinawa. 
Okay, so look at what your organization in your country recommends. I often say to people, go to a new community. Go set up in a new community. You don't want to be competition to your home dojo or your previously uh, employed dojo as immediate competition. Number one, you then start undermining or undercutting the existing school. If that school does not have any more capacity and they have a waiting list, which does happen from time to time, then work with that instructor to create a satellite dojo. And then you run the satellite dojo and what you earn is yours. Okay? And what the main dojo earns is that instructor's. And then you support each other and grow each other. My wife always reminds me that a rising tide lifts all boats. So when the dojo up the road from me, which is a Shorakan dojo, does well, I am very, very stoked for that dojo. And my friend who is an instructor in that dojo will bear me out because we do it for one another. We both agree. When my dojo does well, her dojo does well. When her dojo does well, my dojo does well. Because we lift each other up. So if we're in the right distance and the right framework and the right amount of space, great. If you're setting up a brand new dojo, sometimes it's better to go into a new community. Go where there's new houses being built, where there are younger people coming in, where there is a possibility that for the next period of time, you're going to have um, young children, etc., who are interested and work on developing a dojo in those kind of communities. You are then no longer a threat to your old dojo. It's very important to make sure that you don't get accused of stealing or poaching students from the old dojo. And many instructors take this very, very personally. So maybe there are a couple of students who have an affinity for you as an assistant instructor and you move to another area and you take 5, 10, 15, 20 students from that dojo. Many old instructors don't like this because they still consider that those students are their students and that their loyalty, their giri, should be to the main dojo that they have grown up in. I do think there are areas where this rule is flexible. So, if you set up a dojo 10 kilometers away and you have children traveling from that community 10 kilometers to train in this dojo and they have an affinity for you, then discuss it with the dojo instructor and say, hey sensei, this person and this person and this person are in that community. That's where I'm setting up this new dojo. Is it possible for them to come and to train with me? They're going to help me. Because the moment you have two or three experienced or partially experienced students in the dojo, it is very, very attractive for new parents coming in to see what you have already produced. And students who are loyal also to you. And so you might set up a new dojo and the sensei from the old dojo will then give allowance for those people. And sooner or later, those people might move there anyway because they live there. They're not having to travel. And in these difficult times, COVID and Corona, where people are not allowed to travel as far, it might just be beneficial. Now, running a dojo as a professional is a very, very, like, controversial topic. Because if you do karate as your sole profession, there are many people, especially in Okinawa and in Japan, that frown upon this. And the idea is that karate should not be a profession as such for people who don't have some kind of other job. And if you're making it a profession, you might be getting into the mill where it's all about gradings and Dan grades and everything else and it's just about money. I hear this and I appreciate it. But at some point, your mainline business, if you happen to be in one, might close down. You might be a tour guide operator and there's no tourism because of COVID. You might be in construction, but there's no construction because your country's economy is in a recession and so buildings are not being built, so you're unemployed. 
So at that point in time, if karate is filling the gap and putting food on the table for yourself and for your family, there's nothing wrong with this. And the senseis in Japan who don't like this, that you are putting food on the table, well, they've forgotten what it is to be hungry. Okay, many of the very, very old senseis were very, very strict about this. Many of them were lucky enough to have a very good job. Some of them, not so. And one of my Japanese senseis always looked upon me as an academically trained teacher and always said to me, you are very, very important. You have a primary job where you are to be respected as sensei, proper sensei, school sensei, teaching real academic subjects. And he always treated me very differently. But he also appreciated that we were running a very, very professional dojo. So I, I fit into the category of people where I have another business, another income, and that income is not all year round. I have a seasonal income where I work for a couple of months of the year and I have to try and make as much money in those few months of the year. And during those months, uh, my seniors and my wife and my family, they step up and they run the dojo's classes and fill in the gaps where I sometimes might not be available because I'm out there making another income. This year has been a particularly hard year for everybody. I haven't made as much money as I have in the past. And that's a fact. And it's a fact globally. And for the average person, you have to then look at how you're going to run your dojo. So for me, if you're going to set up a dojo and you're going to run it as a professional dojo, be a professional. If you have hang-ups because of something that the sensei said in Japan or in Okinawa 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, um, is holding you back. You need to shelve it. Okay, simple term, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have to survive. That's a base existence. And if you have the skill set to be a good karate instructor and make a difference to your community, make a difference to your own physical situation, that you do not end up doing illegal stuff to make a living, then rather be a karate instructor than a criminal. Um, and so I think that most people would look at this. So number one, you need to liaise with your dojo, your style, your head instructor. Can I, do I qualify to be a teacher? Have I done the time? Because you have to have done the time. Is my location suitable? Am I in a community where the community is growing and there's a potential growth factor in that community and is it far enough away from the old dojo? Can I do this on my own or am I going to be contributing massively in forms of tribute to the main dojo? There's always a tribute. Uh, we call it affiliation and the tribute will go from our dojo or from our sub, um, our satellite and sub dojos into the main dojo from the main dojo to the national federation. Okay, so there is some kind of affiliation that needs to be covered. Do you meet the national requirements according to your sporting code? Some countries have extremely high entry level gatekeeping strategies to keep wishy washy people out of karate instruction. And for good reason, because they want the best of the best. So, do you meet those requirements from the National Federation? Uh, do you meet the safety requirements, etc.? Have you got first aid training? Um, is your facility safe? Um, is it suitable? Okay. And then, are you okay with it? Are you okay with becoming a karate instructor on your own? Are you going to continue your own training and continue your learning? Are you going to try and develop? Because we all have to. Okay. You don't get a black belt and then it's all over. You get a black belt and then it all starts. Um, third, Dan, are you ready to be an instructor? Are you ready to be um, in an organization that's working towards an endpoint? Are you able to offer something fair? So I'm going to talk about how some karate instructors will sit on the sideline. They will have a team of instructors working for them. I know of a particular karate instructor here in South Africa who at one stage was considered a karate millionaire. He had a team of probably 10, 15 instructors in South Africa and a few other countries around us who were teaching on his behalf. He had a very high grade 
And he would get very upset when these young instructors would suddenly go, they're doing all the work and um, they're doing everything. They, they weren't allowed to do the gradings. He'd come and sit on the gradings. And sometimes the students would ask, who's that man sitting around the table? They didn't even know who he was because they'd never seen him in a class, never seen. Now, this model is a good model for exploitation, but it is a bad model for developing your students. And sadly, that particular instructor, many of these instructors underneath him have left over the years and have gone on to become independent instructors or join other organizations where they are treated as instructors with the rights to run a dojo and to grade their students to a certain grade. At a certain point, the organizational rules will dictate where and how much you can grade and what sort of charge point you can have. Obviously, most dojos that are being run in a professional uh, way and who have a very strong lineage and strong link will have guidelines in this regard because they want to stop anybody just making it into a money mill. Um, dojos that do operate, there are dojos that operate on the money mill principle. Um, and if you troll through uh, Facebook and <laughs> through YouTube and documentaries and forums, there's a lot of discussion about the proverbial Mac Dojo, where um, you arrive and it's just about money, 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 money. And uh, three or four weeks after joining, you get, wow, you get your first grading and your first belt. Um, we'll leave them to themselves. Um, these dojos, these fly-by-nights setups can sometimes fall and sink. I know in some countries they are paying and they're they're overwhelmingly big. Um, and I would say to anybody who's watching this as a parent, be, be vigilant of this, be wary of this. You know, the average time it takes the average person to get a black belt in Japan is about three years, and that's normally because they train five days a week. If you're training two hours a week, expect to spend more than three years working towards getting a black belt. Okay, my personal viewpoint, there are no black belts who are 10 and 12 years old. The child does not have the mental capacity. So when you walk in a dojo and you see this kind of stuff, then there is, these are question marks that you should be vigilant of. As an instructor setting up a dojo, what type of instructor are you going to become? Don't make your dojo about something that can be taken away. There are many, many dojos that are teaching just sport karate right now. And with the only competitions happening being online virtual competitions and then only kata form, um, if you happen to be a committed dojo, you're going to have a few issues because you're going to struggle to motivate your students because the motivation is an external thing called a medal. And what it should be to have the student on the floor and to keep the student on the floor um, is something that is not extrinsic. It is something intrinsic, something internal, some kind of growth that the student experiences and some kind of development the student. And this is your job as an instructor, to take a student and to make them grow from in and become better people, to become better at everything and to become more confident and to become more capable in living in the world, the chaos outside, and using karate as a tool to do this. So um, it's very, very important to, to work on this. And the moment we take away the extrinsic goal and replace it with an intrinsic goal, we are finding that we have a much better retention rate. Okay, um, I had the most intellectual discussion that lasts probably 10 minutes while walking through Okinawa with a uh, fellow karateka in grade my junior in life experience, my senior. And he said to myself and my mate, um, my karate partner is such that we mustn't lose touch of the, the business principle that acquisition is a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive than retention. So whatever you do in your dojo, when you set up a dojo and you get students in, you want to keep those students in. And you've got to work out how that's going to work best for you. And you've got to work that you're constantly growing that student. And that student can feel and experience that growth. And that growth is sometimes created through positive experiences. And sometimes it's created through a negative experience, namely failure. 
and knowing when and how this happens. To fail students willy-nilly for the sake of failing them is also counterproductive. So as a dojo instructor, setting up your dojo, you want to set up a business that is going to grow and is going to blossom. And you are going to try and do all the right things by all the right organizations. Get all the right pieces of paper in place. Find a venue that is suitable to train in. And in these COVID times, if the weather permits, I live in South Africa. Right now, it is our summer period. You may be able to train outside and to have open air training, but you may have to meet all the requirements of the various layers of protection, such as social distancing, wearing a mask, um, sanitizing, filling a tracing form, uh, so that if anybody does get sick, we can trace. Okay, making sure your students possibly have, and we have an app in South Africa that allows people to be tracked and traced. And that's it. So, for my friend who's down in the Cape, who's struggling, you have paid much tribute to your sensei, to your organization over the years. They have never reimbursed you as such. And if you wish to start a dojo, start a dojo. Do the right thing, go speak to the sensei and explain why you're starting your dojo. And in these difficult times where that dojo might be the lifeline you need to stay alive so that you can carry on living and you can support your family and your, your children, there's nothing wrong with this. There is never anything wrong with this. Because if this makes the difference between keeping you alive and keeping you on the right side of the law, then you have to do this. If your only alternative is to resort to crime and criminal activity, that's it. If the dojo instructor views what you're doing as criminal, just remember, meet what the dojo requirements are, what the national requirements are to open a dojo, be far enough away that you're not taking students, that you're not poaching students, that you're not a threat to the old dojo, set up your business, do it as a professional, be as professional as possible, do it as hardcore as possible, focus on developing your students intrinsically rather than extrinsically, don't make the motivation about competition and refereeing and things like that. that that's not going to keep your dojo. Make it about karate and growing the individual. So that's my 23 minutes worth and hopefully my wife won't have too much editing to do and this video will go up as soon as possible on Facebook and on um, YouTube on our channel. If you are a senior instructor and you don't like what I have to say, I'm sorry. I'm just calling it as I see it based on the situation that we're in in our country. I'm a fortunate person. I have two businesses, one of them being a karate business, one of them being a family-run business. And it breaks my heart to see somebody having to beg on the side of the road when they're a good karate instructor because they're not allowed to open a dojo because their sensei said so. And they've been doing karate in excess of 20 years um, as an instructor. So with that in mind, mm. something had to be said. And if you dig it, put it out there. Hey, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much.